Hey everybody, today we're going to start the Middle Ages, so I'm going to have three video lectures on the Middle Ages. So if you want to follow along, this is Middle Ages 1. Alright, so if you look at slide 2, I kind of got a diagram or a timeline, I guess, of, of how you would divide up the Middle Ages. So the Western Roman Empire fell in 476. Um, Sometimes historians refer to the end of the Roman Empire kind of bleeding into the Middle Ages as late antiquity, um, but basically you've got three different time periods of the Middle Ages. You've got the early Middle Ages, the high Middle Ages, and the late Middle Ages. Now these are kind of just arbitrary numbers that historians have kind of selected, so every textbook you look at, these dates will be a little bit different. Um, so that's just kind of if you need a reference point, that's just kind of the ones that I like to go with. So um, the church father, St. Augustine, he had actually divided up history into six periods. Um, you can look at slide three and see all six. If you lived after the life of Jesus, you were in the sixth and final period of history. Um, so Augustine, the church father, saw history as it relates to kind of the history of the Bible, the history of the church. Um, that changes later on uh, during the Renaissance. You have this uh, humanist, Francesco Petrarca. He's just known as Petrarch. Um, he divided up history differently. So these are just kind of different ways that people look at history. Um, he's kind of the one credited with inventing the idea of the Middle Ages. Uh, he didn't actually use the word Middle Ages. Um, the earliest that I've seen that the word Middle Ages is used is in 1469. Um, Medium, Ivum is used in this document, and that's kind of the first reference I know of, of Middle Ages being used. But Petrarch used the term Dark Age or the Age of Darkness. Basically, he, he looked at history and he said, the Greeks and the Romans were awesome. That was classical, the classical age. You know, literature was great, government was great, everything about that age was was magnificent. Architecture, but then Rome fell. Rome got sacked by the barbarians, the Western Roman Empire collapsed, and basically culture, government, everything just went backwards. It fell into an age of darkness. So for Petrarch, there were really two ages of history, kind of the glorious classical past and the rot of the Middle Ages. So that's kind of how he saw it. Um, religion in late antiquity, early Middle Ages, basically before Constantine's conversion, kind of the heroes of the church, I guess you could say, were martyrs and confessors. Confessors were, were people who would confess their faith to the Roman officials and then be punished for it in one way or another. After Constantine's conversion and Theodosius making Christianity the official religion, basically it's not illegal to be a Christian anymore. So you start having new ways of like practicing the Christian faith. Uh, sometimes these were people were referred to as athletes of God. Since you're not going to get martyred anymore, you start having more ascetics, hermits, monks, um, those type of people grow in popularity. Um, a lot of early Christians tried to escape from the world, from, from the city. Um, they would go into the countryside and kind of live by themselves or live in small groups. Um, so this is kind of where the origin of monasticism uh, begins. <clears throat> if you look at slide six, six, there's a few kind of of the early, uh, late antiquity um, church fathers, kind of famous people. Antony, he's kind of nicknamed the father of monasticism. He lived as a hermit in the deserts of Egypt, um, you know, to escape city life, seek God through par Prayer, solitude, self-denial. Um, uh, Pacamonius, uh, he lived the hermetical lifestyle as well. Um, he brought other hermits together to kind of live together. So that community, uh, that monastic community. Um, there are even people called stylites. I think these people are really interesting. They would build like a large pole or a large platform, and they would just sit up there and pray. Uh, there's this one famous stylite, Simeon. Uh, he stayed up there for something like, you know, decades, and he would just sit up there. People would send him food. 
and he would just pray. People would come to him and they would want their needs prayed for by him. Um, so there's a lot of different kind of ways that Christians are expressing their faith, I guess you could say. Um, eventually monasticism, it begins in the East and it spreads to the West where the Roman Empire used to be. Um, St. Basil wrote the first set of rules for monks. Um, you have regular clergy and secular clergy. Um, regular clergy are ones that follow rules, like rules set down for monks. Um, one of the things St. Basil said is, I don't want you to practice self-torture. You know, sometimes monks would like whip themselves or intentionally not eat for a long time to kind of suffer. He said, don't do that. That's too extreme. Um, maybe the most famous set of rules were written by St. Benedict. Um, he basically wrote a guidebook for monastic life. He talked about how you need regular prayer, discipline, practice moderation. You know, don't starve yourself, but don't eat all the time. You know, kind of take the middle road. Uh, silence is a big deal in the rule of St. Benedict. Um, he focuses a lot on prayer. Uh, he also said if you're going to be a monk, you need to be useful to the community. So manual labor is something that the monks regular, regularly did. And this could be like uh, draining a swamp, clearing a forest so that you could start a farm. It could be copying down manuscripts. Um, there's this balance between isolation and involvement. Uh, according to St. Benedict, he wanted you to make yourself useful. Um, so if you look at slide nine, that's just kind of a summary of, of the contribution of monks. I mean, they practiced farming, they, they pioneered new techniques, they reclaimed wastelands, uh, they preserved a lot of knowledge about Rome, um, they copied a lot of ancient manuscripts, they organized libraries, so a lot of the stuff we know today about the Greeks and the Romans, their literature, their writings, we know about them thanks to monks copying them down. And I think some of the monks like to read classical literature, but probably the main reason is uh, Greek and Latin are very important to the Bible because the New Testament is written in Greek and the Western church used Latin in their church services. So basically, monks knew that if you wanted to understand Christianity, you probably needed a good understanding of understanding of Greek and Roman or Greek and Latin. Sorry. So studying the classic literature of the Greeks and the Romans was a good way to learn that language. So that's one reason why they did it. Um, Saint Augustine was probably the most influential church father um, in the early Middle Ages. He's from North Africa. Uh, he wrote tons of books um, kind of dealing with spirituality. Um, his book, The Confessions, is an autobiography. Um, he kind of has some some interesting stories. There's this one story you can click on and read if you want to. It's the pear story. Basically, Augustine talks about how he first understood that he was kind of a rotten human being. He said him and his friends would, would steal pears from this guy from his trees. And they would just throw the pears away. They would throw them at people. They would throw them at buildings. And Augustine said to himself, you know, I could understand if somebody would steal because they're hungry. But my friends and I were stealing just to have fun. Like, that's kind of a really, you know, terrible thing to do as a human. Stealing, wasting food just to have fun. So he, he has little stories, kind of morals, moral stories all throughout his book. Um... One of his most famous books is City of God. He basically tried to reassure people that even though the Roman Empire was collapsing, um, you know, God was in charge of history. Um, he said, you can either live for this world or the next world. That's kind of how he divided people up. Um, another important church father was St. Jerome. Uh, he wrote the Vulgate. That's the Latin translation of the Bible that the Catholic Church used for centuries. So there's a lot of kind of new uh, behavior going on in the early church. Um, there's also some new barbarian tribes that are really important. If you look at slide 12, you can kind of see a map of Europe. 
Um, we're going to focus on the kingdom of the Franks. They're the most important barbarian tribe in Europe, the Frankish kingdom. Um, they're German barbarians from the Rhine River. Their legendary founder is a guy named Merovec. Um, maybe he was real, maybe he wasn't. But um, there's two famous Frankish dynasties, the Merovingians, those are the ones from Merovic, and the Carolingians. Um, and a lot of what we know about the Franks comes from Gregory of Tours. He writes about the Merovingians, so you can get his history book if you like primary sources. Clovis I is the first Merovingian, the first Frankish king to, to unite the Frankish people. Um, in about 20 years, he conquers all of these various Frankish tribes and puts them under his rule. Um, so long hair, beards are a symbol of, of his Merovingian dynasty. This dynasty is going to last until 751. That's when the Carolingians will eclipse them. Um, Clovis is important because he's one of the first barbarians to convert to Christianity. Um, that's really important because that means Europe is going to basically be kind of in the Christian sphere. Um, he's also a very violent guy. He killed a lot of his family members. He was really paranoid. Um, sometimes he would kill family members and then 10 years later, he would send out decrees throughout his empire and he would say, I'm really lonely. I don't know if any of my family is still alive. If you're a distant cousin or an uncle that I don't know about, come to my court. I want to get to know you. Well, then family members would show up and then he would just have another round of killing. So. He's a very violent guy. Um, there's a story of the silver bull. Um, when he's raiding and pillaging, he would allow his soldiers to keep some of the loot. And there's a story about one, one of his soldiers gets a silver bull and Clovis really wants it, but the soldier refuses. And a year later, Clovis ends up killing this guy because he wouldn't give him this bull that was silver that he liked. So. He's kind of a lustful, violent figure. Um, the government of the Franks, if you look at slide 20, a lot of the government that these barbarian tribes set up is similar to what the Romans had, or it uses Latin terminology that the Romans would have known. So you have the, the Kiwitas, the city and its surrounding territories. You have the Comites. Um, that's like a kind of a govern, governor or a mayor, I guess you could say. There's a, a commander, a military commander known as the Dukes. Um, so a lot of these barbarians uh, borrow from the Romans in terms of government. Uh, during this kind of early Frankish reign, uh, the region of Gaul, that's what the Romans would have called it. It starts to be called Francia. Um, the Merovingians viewed their kingdoms as their private property, basically. They didn't believe in the idea of the state like the Romans did. Um, so a lot of times the Merovingians, when they are ready to die, they will divide the kingdom up among their sons and uh, kind of spread it out. Uh, the Franks did adopt some stuff from the Romans. They adopt the Latin language. They live in ur an urban lifestyle similar to the Romans, and they kind of organize their government similar to the Romans. Now, the, the dynasty that's going to replace them is the Carolingians. This is the most famous uh, political dynasty during the early Middle Ages. They're based in Austrasia. And the most important political figure in the Frankish kingdom is the mayor of the palace, uh, the Maior. Basically, this is like, I guess you could say, the king's right-hand man. He helps run the military, he recruits soldiers, he oversees finances. So basically, this is the guy that does all the work. And if he's going around recruiting soldiers and paying them, you can kind of see how soldiers might be more loyal to him than the king. Because even though the mire of the palace does everything in the name of the king, the mire is the one that actually physically goes to the soldiers and pays them. So the soldiers know where the real power lies. Um, so like I said, the Carolingians will replace the Merovingians. And just over time, the Myers of the palace, they start to win over the aristocrats of these different, uh, areas. Um, 
So probably the most famous Carolingian up until Charlemagne is Charles Martel. Um, he defeats the Muslims at the Battle of Poitiers in AD 732. If you kind of look at a map on slide 28, you can see how Islam was spreading. It had been in Spain and it was spreading up into France. And at the Battle of Poitiers, Charles Martel defeats them. So Europe will remain Christian, not Muslim. Um, what ends up happening is um, Pepin the Short, he's the mire of the palace, okay? He's not king. He writes a letter to the Pope, and this is what he says. This is slide 33. He says, is it right that the one who wears the crown does not exercise power, and the one who exercises power does not wear the crown? So he's basically saying the king has the crown, but he doesn't do anything. On the other hand, I, as the mire of the palace, I don't wear the crown, but I make everything work. And the Pope says, no, that's not right. The one who actually exercises power should wear the crown. So Pepin the Short deposes the last Merovingian king. Uh, he doesn't kill him. He has his hair shaved. His long hair was kind of the thing that the Merovingian kings did. So he has him shaved and he has him sent away to a monastery. <clears throat> So you have the Carolingian dynasty now, um, and because Pepin the Short got help from the Pope, he then helps the Pope against the Lombards, their barbarian kingdom in northern Italy. Um, Pepin fights the Lombards on behalf of the Pope. Um, then he gives the Pope what is known as the Papal States. This is the donation of Pepin. So basically, historians have kind of narrowed it down to a few ways the Carolingians ended up basically seizing the throne from the Merovingians. You know, militarily speaking, the Carolingians were very successful. You know, Charles Martel was a mire of the palace, and he was a Carolingian. He's defeating all these uh, Frankish tribes and kingdoms, these other barbarian kingdoms. He also defeats the Muslims. Um, the Carolingians know that they need to have an alliance with the Pope. If you can control, or if you're if you're in cahoots with the the religious powers that be, that's important. Um, and they also label themselves as the heirs to the Roman Empire. Sometimes the Carolingians will call themselves consuls. Um, they do things that make themselves seem Roman. So that's kind of how the Carolingians take over. Now, eventually, the most famous Carolingian is a man named Charlemagne or other people know him as Charles the Great. Um, he's the most famous Carolingian rule, ruler. He rules over the kingdom of the Franks from 768 to 814. Sometimes Charlemagne gets called the father of Europe. Um, he also gets crowned emperor in 800. So he kind of revives that Roman feel to his, to his kingdom. Um, so he's the most famous Carolingian. He fights a lot of wars against barbarians, especially the Saxons, um, and he's pretty brutal. Um, he forces barbarian tribes to convert to Christianity. Um, he fights in Italy. He fights in Spain. Um, he spends most of his reign fighting wars. If you look at slide 41, you can kind of see how big his kingdom is. It's basically all of France, parts of northern Italy, and parts of Germany. Um, so he starts centralizing power as he rules, um, and eventually in 799, the Pope, Pope Leo III, he's forced out of Rome. There's a lot of political intrigue, you know, different families want to become Pope, and one family pushes out Pope Leo, and he goes to Charlemagne and basically asks for help. So Charlemagne goes to Rome, and he installs Leo as the Pope, puts him back on the th on the in the papacy basically says you know pope leo i don't know if you are misbehaving but you got to promise from this point on not to misbehave so leo takes an oath that says he won't do anything bad so charlemagne helps out the pope and then uh in 800 pope leo crowns charlemagne as the emperor in his official title 
he crowns him Augustus, crowned of God, great and pacific emperor of the Romans. So, And he rules under this motto, the revival of the Roman Empire. So basically, Charlemagne is trying to keep alive the idea of Rome. Um, so it kind of shows you, you know, this is 800. Rome collapsed in 476. So this is more than almost 400 years later, and people are still wanting that idea of Rome. So that shows you how strong the idea of the Roman Empire was. Um, Charlemagne played a big role in church affairs. Um, now, during the Middle Ages, a lot of people don't know this, but secular rules dominated the church. It wasn't the other way around. The church did not have more power than rulers. Secular rules often imposed their will on the church. Um, but it was kind of a two-way street. The Carolingians really used the church officials to staff government uh, jobs. And usually church officials were educated. They understood Latin. So, you know, you couldn't just go out to the village and get peasants to help you with the government. You needed people that could read and write, and that was usually church officials. Um, and the, the clergy also had spiritual powers over the people. Um, you know, people would go to church, go to mass. Um, priests would kind of help them. You know, priests would marry them, baptize their children, uh, oversee their funeral and their burial arrangements. So basically, Charlemagne knows that he needs to be in good with the church in order to kind of rule his kingdom. Um, so yeah, the Carolingians kind of kind of rule over the popes and the Catholic Church. Um, there's something called the Carolingian Renaissance. It's a time of great revival and education. This is probably the most famous Renaissance before the Italian Renaissance of the 1314 and 1500s. Um, basically, a lot of classical pagan literature is studied and copied down. And like I said earlier, they do this because they know it will help them better understand the Greek and the Latin of the Christian Bible. Um, but Charlemagne also helped. Uh, he wanted to make sure that priests knew what, what religious texts actually said. Um, and Charlemagne did want to raise the general level of education within his Frankish kingdom. Um, so he invites scholars from all over Europe to come to his kingdom to educate people. Um, so these scholars teach people, uh, boys and girls. Uh, they prepare new editions of religious texts. There's a lot of religious texts floating around. And maybe monks make mistakes once in a while copying stuff. So basically, Charlemagne will get these, uh, these scholars to gather all the religious texts and then they'll kind of read them and they'll find out where they think the errors are and then they'll make like an official copy that uh, that figures out so there's no more mistakes. Um, there's also a new type of handwriting or uh, way of doing things called Carolingian minuscule and this seems kind of weird but if you look at slide 50 on the left that's an old type of manuscript there were usually no capital letters. There were no, there was no punctuation. There were no uh, spaces in between words. So it was just one big blob on a on a on a piece of paper. The Carolingians actually start introducing capital letters. They divide up uh, sentences with punctuation. They put spaces between words. Um, so if you look at slide 50, the manuscript on the left looks kind of strange. But the one on the right, that's the Carolingian minuscule, that looks more uh, recognizable. If you look at slide 51, that's just another map kind of showing you the, the Carolingian Empire. Eventually, there's a group of people that start wreaking havoc on Europe. These are the Vikings. Um, they did get called the Vikings back then, but more commonly they're known as the Northmen, the men from the north. Um, during the 8th, 9th, and 10th centuries, they sack a lot of European cities or kingdoms. Um, they start raiding monasteries. Uh, usually they attack places that are close to rivers or close to the sea. Eventually it gets so bad that the Carolingians start paying uh, protection money to these Vikings. You know, So the Vikings every year will come raid a Carolingian city, 
So the Carolingian ruler will say, can I just pay you every year instead of you burning our city and just taking away everything? Um, eventually, the Vikings are giving, given land. The most famous example is in, is in AD 911. The Frankish king, Charles the Simple, he basically says to the Vikings, will you stay in my country? I'll give you some land and you can protect me from other Vikings. So this land that they get is called Normandy. And this is important later on because they're because of the Norman conquest. But Normandy is this land given to the Vikings so that they'll protect basically the Carolingian Empire. Um, if you look at slide 53, you can see how the Vikings went all over Europe. They went to the Middle East. Um, Vikings went to Baghdad. Vikings went to Russia. Um, there's a statue that they dug up of Buddha in one of the Scandinavian countries because the Vikings went all the way, all the way to the eastern part of the world. So the Vikings really trade a lot um, in addition to kind of pillaging the, the cities of Europe. Um, eventually, the Carolingian Empire collapses. Um, you know, there's pressure from the Vikings. The Carolingians divide up their empire amongst their sons. This leads to civil war. Uh, Charlemagne's grandsons fought a three-year civil war from 840 to 843. Eventually you have the Treaty of Verdun in 8483, or sorry, 843. This divides up the Carolingian Empire between three of Charlemagne's grandsons. Uh, you get West Francia and East Francia, those become the future states of France and Germany. West Francia is France and East Francia is Germany. Um, some historians have called the Treaty of Verdun the birth certificate of Europe. Um, if you look at slide 55, you can kind of see there's the dividing line. Um, you eventually get the emergence of France and Germany. Um, the Capetians, they're kind of the, the French dynasty, and the Ottonians are the, the German dynasty. Um, basically, what ends up happening is counts, aristocrats, nobles, they start to exercise independence. Um, kings stop making visits to large part of their territories, and you kind of have this uh, devolution of power in Europe. Kings start to get weaker and weaker as, as aristocrats get more and more powerful. Um, in, in France, you have more of a breakdown of power than, than in Germany. Um, you get these people called Castellans that pop up. Basically, if you own a castle, you're called a Castellan. And basically, throughout France, you have all these people building castles, and they start controlling the territories around their castles. And if you're a king, you don't necessarily have the resources to, to break down a castle. You know, this is before the time of gunpowder. Um, you can't shoot a cannon at the city walls. Um, so basically, royal authority breaks down in France. In Germany, royal authority doesn't break down quite as quickly. Um, basically, the German rulers like Henry I or Otto I, they win military victories against eastern barbarian tribes and because they're always fighting the Eastern barbarians, they, they keep a tight rein on the military and on finances. Um, Otto I gets crowned emperor in 962, um, and his, his kingdom starts getting referred to as the Holy Roman Empire. Um, that's this big kind of blob on, the, on Central Europe. It, whenever you look at a map of the Middle Ages, you know, 900, 900 1000, 1100, whatever, there's this big area called the Holy Roman Empire. It's basically Germany. Um, England, during this time, England kind of undergoes a different kind of history than, I guess, Europe. Um, before the Roman Empire collapsed in 476, England was kind of on its own. The Romans actually left Britain about AD 410. Um, they withdrew their army from Britain because of all the chaos going on in Rome. Um, Germanic tribes move into England. You get the Angles and the Saxons from Germany. You get the Jutes or the Utes from Denmark. Um, and basically, they conquer a lot of the British island. Um, Roman civilization disappears in England. 
the economy takes a backwards slide, um, Roman towns are abandoned, uh, even the name Britain is dropped and you get the name England, which comes from the Angles. Um, Christianity disappears in England and you get a revival of paganism. Um, they've got examples of they'll dig up Roman coins and the coins will have a, a hole punched in the middle and they'll be used as necklaces. So basically you have that money disappears in Britain. It's just used for jewelry. It's not used to actually finance the economy. You just have bartering basically. England really gets attacked by the Vikings because England is a small island and basically most of it's accessible by the ocean or by the seas. Um, the Vikings end up setting up kingdoms in, in Great Britain. Um, one king does resist the Vikings, King Alfred the Great. He builds fortified towns that kind of break up the Vikings' raids. Usually the Vikings wanted to attack a city quickly and then get out of there. But if they got to lay siege to a city, that's too long for them. So King Alfred does a good job resisting the Vikings. Um, if you look at slide 66, for about a period of almost, you know, 30, 40 years, England was ruled by basically Scandinavian kings. So England might have seemed more Scandinavian if it weren't for something known as the Norman Conquest. This is a really important event in English history. In 1066, the last Anglo-Saxon king died. Now he doesn't have an heir to the throne. Three people claim to be king of England. Um, this guy named Harold from Norway, King Harold of Norway. This guy, William, the Duke of Normandy. He's a one of those descendants of the Vikings that settled in France. And then you get this guy, Harold of England. He was a Anglo-Saxon aristocrat, and some people wanted him to become king. So basically, these three guys go to battle to be king of England. Um, and Harold of Norway invades England. And he fights a battle at Stamford Bridge and is defeated. So, so Harold of England looks like he's going to be king of England. But his army basically wore itself out fighting the Scandinavians. So then when he goes to fight William, uh, the Duke of Normandy, William defeats Harold of England at the Battle of Hastings. And this is known as the Norman Conquest. William gets renamed William the Conqueror. Um, so there's this really weird time in English history, and this kind of was always hard for me to understand, but you know, William speaks French. So for a long time, the rulers of England are French speakers, okay? Um, now they keep some of the Anglo-Saxon institutions that were around. There's this one called the Writ uh, that was really famous, and this, this lasts throughout English history. Basically, it's a written notice if you're if you've done something that you can get arrested for, they have to give you a note saying this is what you're being arrested for. Um, William the Conqueror and his descendants they go around collecting information about all the wealth in England. This is called the Doomsday Book. Um, so there's this big book that kind of tells us about the financial history of England. Um, and the Norman conquest created this really strange relationship between England and France. And this is going to be important to remember when we talk about the Hundred Years' War. Okay, so William the Conqueror was from France. So he's under the authority of the French, the French king. So when he conquers England, it's almost like a representative of France conquered England. So the kings of England are vassals of the kings of France. So they're subordinate to France. But they also rule in their own right as kings of England. So for a long time in English history, there's this weird question. Are the kings of England equal to the kings of France or are they subordinate to them? Um, and if you look at slide, um, uh, sorry, I don't know what number this is, but it's towards the end. This Angevin Empire, you can see how England controls some of the land in France, and that's because you know, if you're king of England, you're also, you know, a French noble, so you can hold land on the continent as well. So that'll be important when we talk about the Hundred Years' War.
Um, so the effects of the Norman conquest, before the conquest, England was kind of under the influence of Scandinavia. You know, maybe England would have been more like, you know, Norway, Sweden, or Denmark, or Finland. But because of the Norman conquest, England gets drawn closer to the continent of Europe because the Normans are Frenchmen. So basically, the Norman conquest means that the future of England is going to be looking towards the continent, not towards the Scandinavian countries.